This first poem is called Apology to a Cat. You are a horrible animal, destructive, unthinking, vindictive. You think that the carpet is your bathroom, the couch your scratching post, the kitchen counter your playroom. You don't like to be petted. You are bored by your toys. You scratch at my hands and you bite up my feet. You don't care when I come home from a difficult day at work. But instead, lie unmoving under the table in a slit of sunlight on the dining room floor. Next to you are the remains of a shredded Ziploc bag. In the middle of the night, you break a coffee mug. While I'm away, you knock over a plant. I find your vomit on the bathroom floor. I find your poop in the closet. You don't like to look at me if you can help it. You don't do any tricks. You don't even purr. I apologize if I expected too much. This next one, this is a very recent poem. And it's, I have a couple that are about kind of autumn, fall. And this is one of those. It's called, And Now Everything Exquisitely Dies. The advancing dusk wields her bloody knife, causing the birds to flee, scaring the trees to a melancholy hue. Murders the high school sweethearts. Her car is packed for college. In that final moment of goodbye, the hug, the kiss, the promise that they will never change. This next one's called The Dust of the Street is as Precious as Gold. In it, I like to have in my poem some specific facts, not fact, well, facts, yes. And in this one, there are two that aren't necessarily uh, explained in there, it's just kind of mentioned, and so I figured I might, I, I might as well let, let, you, let you in on it. I have in here 70, 733 miles an hour and 67,000 miles an hour. And where we are here in Salem-Kaiser, when the Earth, rot uh, when the earth uh, rotates, we're going at 733 miles an hour. And of course, when the Earth goes around the sun, we're traveling at 67,000 miles an hour. <clears throat> the dust of the street is as precious as gold. <clears throat> you drive past the streetside prophets, speed from Jerusalem to Emmaus in half an hour, Salem to Woodburn in 20 minutes takes eight hours by foot. Eight hours of effort, stopping to rest, use the bathroom, knees hurt, feet, neck, sunburn. Eight hours to change your life. Eight hours with the locust eaters, with the wild honey drinkers. The scales will fall from your eyes and people will look like trees walking around. Eight hours to witness the bloody birth in the morning, clouds lifting overhead like the refrain of a powerful song. The cycle of the sun being eaten again by the west. Without trying, we speed ahead 733 miles an hour not to mention 67,000 miles per hour. 
but it's the velocity of our feet that move us. The dust of the road will cling to you. Coat your feet and legs. Baptize your face and hair with road wisdom, or at least road. It is the road that changes us, rarely the destination. The way gold changes us, the way we are changed by gold. This next one is called, The Old Man is Equivalent to Ventura Harbor. Now with this, I do a lot of poems that have two different voices in it, or two different sections to it, and with this, I use the mathematical equivalent sign. So this is two stanzas long, this poem. And so, using the equivalent sign, it almost sets itself up as an equation. The old man is equivalent to Ventura Harbor. My wedding day. Dad wanted to go fishing. Along the Saturday morning deserted tangle of gray rock, the calming jetty laughs at foam fists. Flat green slumbers on the lee side. While above the prowling gulls know there will be nothing for them. Maybe that's the way love is. Is equivalent to the music of masts. Randomly precise in early evening as ragged tails of fog comb its fingers across the wall of stiff bunch grass before waving goodbye to the Pacific. It's time to go, dash away, and play through the resilient rills of Arroyo Verde Park, Victoria Boulevard sleeping in an abandoned sage turned circle before the freedom of orange groves, hidden polka dots. Always remembering the boat song before dissolving into the sky. Maybe that's the way love is. This poem here is called Fixed Points in California. I use two different voices in this. And this was published, oh, a year or two ago in Manifest West, which is a anthology of poems about California or from California writers. And I grew up in California. It mentions three specific places, but those specific places don't really necessarily, aren't necessarily required for the to understand kind of the, the poem, it's just rooting it in a location. Fixed points in California. Canyon country. The pink tiled roofs washed away from us and down the hill to break on the shore of the Antelope Valley Highway. There was piano music in the backyard as the professor and his wife shared a cool beer. We like to think of homes as fixed points, secure compass readings. Oxnard. In the 50s, the stucco ranch houses must have been something. Not now, with 10 people living in each. Anonymous, pulsing bass pulls up to the corner. Someone without a face walks to the car window, then steps away. But we are actually moving transient, recklessly changing direction. Oakland. From Bart's 
flickering window, away from the rubble of the Nimitz freeway, the lightless remains of stately houses, gutted and carved up. It is quiet here. A far away siren senade. A van from the electric company steals down the street towards Berkeley. Homes are neighborhoods complexion as constant as eyeliner. This poem here is called Seagull as Soul. I write a lot of poems that are in series. This one came from a series of poems I wrote on a single day called New Year's Eve Morning. And I wrote it on December 31st, 2009, when I drove out to Lincoln City in a storm. And this was the last poem in that series. And this one was published in Sediments Literary Arts Journal, I think either late last year or early this year. Seagull as Soul. There is a dance at Southwest 33rd. The seagulls in faded baptismal gowns blink yellow eyes filled with envy with crackling ferocity. Driving out to the dump, rumbling in the cracked black seat of the blue pickup, the speedometer needle grinding, swinging jerkily, 90 to 10 to 90 to 10. The scent heavy in January storm, bitter and moody, when the white and gray sheet lifted briefly to settle on its smelly, soggy, dirty bed. There is a dance at the Dee River. The seagulls in sand-stained wedding gowns, stained gray, stained white, never quite pure. Above Brownsville, the land sloping away and the trees blanketing the softly slumbering Missouri, the black dress, the black umbrella, the white robe, the tear, the false grass laid to protect black shoes from mud, the cackling laugh is as out of place as the round white stain on the sleeve of a black suit. There is a dance at road's end. The seagulls in their dirty burial gowns lift and laughed where the culvert pours foam into foam. This poem here is called In Conclusion 13. I've written at least 13 of these. Things keep on concluding, and so I keep on coming up with more. But there's a word in this poem that I should probably at least explain a little bit, and the word is cantatur. Back in the 70s, we kept on hearing about women with high voices who could break glass. And from what I'm told, this is the male version of that, of that person, so I don't think that it's actually possible. In conclusion 13. The boxes are half unpacked in that cavern created by two dorm beds bolted to the floor. One end, blinds stares blankly to the street. The other, a door, 
leading to the ambiguous hall. He finished his sandwich at the desk as I soothed the sheets and blankets. There was a lot to put away. But it was for him to do, and for me to step away from the soap and the dirty clothes hamper and the euphonium and the Doctor Who blanket. There was no place to sit. So instead, I just thought of the first poem I wrote after we had met almost 19 years before. When they handed me Tom, he was an incredulous eggplant. Wrapped in a sterile sheet, he peered out disapprovingly at hands and light and sound. Eyes, dark as time below a furrow pink brow, new and wrinkled, looked up. He yawned with the voice of a cantator, and something within me happily broke. Later, outside the glass door that protects the music majors from the world, there was nothing left to do. No more daily banter. No more walks through dusk's gathering arms. No more kitchen discoveries. No more lessons that were never really taught. And in any event, there was no time for that anyway. So I kiss you on the forehead, and we both turned to go. But it was I who glanced back again and watched you walk through the glass door and up the stairs and disappear into the hallway. This is the last poem that I brought today. It's called Winter Street Bridge. It was written about this time, and actually the, it's a very short poem, but the scenes depicted in it are going on right now if you were to go down there to Winter Street and stand on the bridge. Winter Street Bridge. Even here on the bridge, traffic, unthinking mews. Looking into the cave of maple and alder, Mill Creek laughing at the rocks, in the cathedral stillness, a leaf slips through the sacred air, kisses the water, and is gone.